If you're just joining, you're listening to The Billionaire Playbook. My name is Conrad Goodwin, and I'm an events associate with ProPublica. For those new to us, ProPublica is a nonprofit newsroom dedicated to investigative journalism. At this event, we will discuss the tax code's relationship to wealth inequality, how exactly the federal tax system is broken, and various reform ideas like Biden's recent billionaire tax proposal. Our panelists will also answer your questions. To ask a question at any point, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen and type it there. Also, if you would like to enable subtitles, click on the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And now, allow me to introduce our speakers. Daniel Hemmel is a professor of law at the University of Chicago Law School and a visiting professor at the New York University School of Law. Benjamin Applebaum is the lead writer on business and economics for the editorial board of the New York Times. Paul Keel is a reporter for ProPublica where he covers business and consumer finance. And our moderator today is ProPublica senior editor and reporter, Jesse Isinger. I'll let Jesse take it from here. Uh, thanks so much, Connor. Uh, really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Daniel and uh, Binya, for joining us. Um, Paul, you had no choice in the matter, of course, so uh, you had to be here. And um, I also want to thank McKinsey for sponsoring investigative journalism and also providing uh, so much fodder for investigative journalism by enabling so much corporate malfeasance around the world. So thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, Paul, Paul, you've been my partner uh, for many years, perhaps too many years, um, from your point of view on tax matters and tax enforcement matters and covering the IRS. I think it's safe to say you've become one of the premier tax reporters in the country. And um, we have been delving into this trove of IRS data for uh, a long time now. Um, we're, not, we're alighting how, exactly how much, but why don't you uh, explain sort of what we have and what we've been doing over the last year or so um, and give the highlights uh, before we can dive into uh, what it means and uh, some of the reform ideas floating around. Sure, yeah, so I mean, it was, it's a tremendous amount of information, I guess is the first thing. So we had thousands of people in it, thousands of the wealthiest Americans uh, and going back uh, more than a decade of information. And it was a lot of information and it was a lot uh, of information or data to wrangle in a way that we could, we could work with it. And we had a team of like 10 reporters on this uh, to, to, you know, first was making sense of the data and then was finding things to say about it uh, in a clear and coherent way. That people want to read about and they were important and so I, I was thinking about how to divide up the stories we came away with and I think probably the easiest way to think about it is there are aspects of our tax code where there are openings that have been given to the wealthy um, that basically say here pay less tax and the clearest example of that I think was this aspect of the Trump tax cuts that provided a tax cut to uh, people, you know, people who owned private businesses, pass-through businesses and so we're able to do a story like look at the data and see exactly like who you know benefited the most be able to match that up with people who who lobbied on the bill um you know have like a, a data point of like 82 families saved a billion dollars in taxes in one year from this one you know provision that was put in the tax code and then there's aspects of our tax code that weren't really given um to the wealthy but more were i don't know if taken is too strong of a word but uh you know, in tax world, they talk about aggressive tax positions sometimes, um, meaning that, you know, there are gray gray lines uh, that can be crossed. Uh, and then it's up to the IRS to, you know, counter whatever position you're taking on your taxes. So we, Peter Thiel was able to amass a $5 billion uh, Roth IRA. Roth IRAs are supposed to be relatively modest sized retirement accounts um, you know, a, a provision in the tax code that's supposed to help them help middle class people build wealth for retirement. Um, and that's not supposed to result in a $5 billion <laughs> uh, Roth. Um, we have billionaires um, saving money by running their horses at the Kentucky Derby. Uh, again, we have our tax code says if it's a hobby, you're not supposed to be able to deduct it. For wealthy business owners, they're able to uh, find gray lines where it's you know a little harder for average people to find those gray lines and take those deductions which we can see in their taxes that they were taking. And then 
we're able to look at the estate tax. You know, you're supposed to at death, these estates, massive estates are supposed to be taxed. But um, there are very long standing ways around this. And so, uh, you know, our colleagues were able to look at, you know, people turning 21 years old and now they got $200 million in a year from a trust that dates back to, you know, 80 years ago um, when, uh, you know, their great grandfather, the grandfather um, opened their the first trust uh, for their for their descendants and, and people are still benefiting from this way around the estate tax. Um, and then it's kind of another category, which is like, you know, we have an income tax and for people who are like wage earners, if you get a W-2, like what your income is, is not really much of a mystery. You're actually given a piece of paper every year that tells you what your income is. Um, but if you own a business uh, or if you are, uh, you own a business and you own a lot of stock in your business, um, you're able to manipulate what is income. Um, and so there's ways to, to erase income that you are re you're receiving through um, means by generating uh, losses through businesses. Um, you know, we highlighted real estate mogul, uh, Steve Ross, who owns the Miami Dolphins, like Time Warner Center, uh, very successful real estate developer who didn't pay income tax for over a decade because his tax return says, my income this year was negative $437 million, which is not a measure from other indications of what he's, how he's doing financially. He's just able to do that because our tax code um, allows uh, you know the wealthy to to take those sorts of deductions and manipulate what is what is income. And then on the other side of the ledger, you have um, people who have large holdings of stock. Um, you know our tax code does not tax uh, income if it's not realized. In other words, turned into cash. So you unless you sell your stock, it doesn't turn into income in your tax return. And so our first story just looked at you know the Bezoses and the Musks and and Buffett, and you know found uh, looked at the top twenty five wealthiest measured how much wealthier they got in a five-year period and compared how much taxes they actually paid. And we came up with uh, what we call our true tax rate of 3.6%, uh, I think. Um, so that's that was the best I could do of a yeah. review. Yeah, uh, that, that was good. Um, and uh, of course, that is the last uh, thing that you just mentioned. Our first story uh, was built around this idea that the ultra wealthy in this country and I, you know, to summarize, really, what we've been writing on is that the ultra wealthy live in a completely different tax universe than average Americans. And the main way that they do this is not through an exotic, um, complicated, uh, hidden fashion, but completely legal and plain vanilla, which is that they allow their wealth to accumulate and they uh, avoid actual income. And the technique is called, uh, coined by a USC uh, professor, buy, borrow, die, you buy uh, or build your assets, you borrow against your wealth. Um, and when you die, you uh, lots of ways to avoid taxes. And this is the main idea behind the billionaire's income tax, uh, Daniel, that Biden has proposed that uh, economists uh, at the White House have kind of embraced um, that uh, Senator Ron Wyden has been championing for uh, several years. Can you summarize this uh, for lay listeners and viewers, and then uh, and then let's let's dive into that proposal. Great. Uh, so Senator Wyden's proposal and. President Biden's proposal slightly different. I'll start with Senator Wyden's and then explain President Biden's. Uh, the tax code only taxes you upon realization. So if you buy Amazon stock for $1, as Jeff Bezos did back in the 1990s, and now it's worth $200 billion, economists would say you've had $200 billion of economic income over that period. But until Jeff Bezos sells his stock, he doesn't pay any tax. Uh, Ron Wyden's idea was, uh, and it's not original to Ron Wyden, economists have talked about this for years, is at the end of every year, we would tax you as if you had sold your assets. Uh, we would mark to market your gains. Uh, so Jeff Bezos would have been paying income tax as he went from having a net worth of zero up to having a net worth of $200 billion today. Uh, that was Wyden's idea. President Biden's idea, uh, is to create a new concept in the code of full income that would be your taxable income plus all of your unrealized gains, uh, the increase in the value of your holdings from the previous year. 
And then if you're already paying a tax of 20% on that, then you're fine and you don't have to worry about the new Biden minimum tax. If you're paying a tax of less than 20% on that, then you have to pay up to 20% and you get to credit any taxes that you pay on unrealized gains against your capital gains taxes when you ultimately sell those assets. So if we take an idea similar to the true income concept used in the first ProPublica piece, the idea would be to make sure that everyone with a net worth of $100 million or more is paying a tax of 20% on their true income. So uh, what we found in that first story is that people like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and uh, Michael Bloomberg and George Soros and Carl Icahn had literally paid zero in federal income tax in uh, recent years. And uh, under both of these proposals, they would not be able to ever pay zero in federal income tax. Is that, uh, is that right? That we, they would define their income as, uh, it, Assuming that they are in, their wealth was growing, they would be paying income tax. Exactly. Uh, now, Mark Zuckerberg would either have zero dollars of income tax this year or potentially have a huge refund uh, because his net worth has gone down by tens of billions of dollars this year because of plummeting values of Facebook stock. Uh, right. But he Let, would have paid a lot of tax on the way up. Right. Let's put a pin in that because uh, that is sort of one of the objections to this tax that uh, people will raise. But uh, I want to go to Binya to ask, um, and uh, I assume that this can be made into more than a one word answer, but does this have any chance of passing, Binya? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, the one would answer is uh, no, or not right now. But, you know, I think big picture, you know, this series to me is really valuable because it sort of it offered kind of a taxonomy of the way that the rich get around the tax code. And it boils down to sort of three big things. You know, the first is the one that gets all the sort of popular attention, which is the idea that the rich are in there creating bespoke loopholes. And that happens for sure, but it's not the primary issue. And the second is the idea that they're constantly stress testing the limits of the tax code. And, and that undoubtedly happens as well. And I think on a greater scale, uh, and you guys wrote about some, some clear examples of that as well. But the big issue and the one that this legislation is seeking to address is just that, uh, you know, our tax code is not designed to tax wealth. Uh, and, and so the vast majority of the way that people who are wealthy accumulate assets, accumulate wealth, and then live off that wealth so that it's functioning in the way that income functions for, you know, that, that wage income functions for most people. Uh, you know, that's just not something that we have a system that, that is able to deal with that. And, and so the question is, you know, can you deal with it legislatively? Can you rewrite the rules in a way that would confront this? There clearly are ways to do that technically. You asked about the politics of it. And, and at least right now, uh, there is not a majority in the United States Senate that that wants to confront this problem. Why, Binya? Because this strikes me as one of the um, more popular uh, ideas uh, among average Americans that taxing the wealthy is consistently uh, strong in the polls with not just Democrats, but independents and uh, Republicans even. Um, lay Republicans, that is, uh, and a majority of Democrats want to tax the rich, um, although maybe not to main senators. But what what is causing this political problem? It seems like a slam dunk for um, a, a kind of populist Democratic Party to embrace. Well, I mean, the, the short answer is that we don't have a populist Democratic Party, but to sort of break it into two pieces, on the Republican side of the aisle, you undoubtedly have large numbers of, of Republicans, I mean, Republican voters who, you know, favor this conceptually, but their representatives in Congress basically operate under the assumption that this is not the salient or at least determinant issue for them when it comes time to go to the polls. And so they're not going to try to act on it, even if, you know, in isolation, you might be able to get a majority of voters to favor this as a practical matter. Their representatives uh, can ignore their uh, their views on this issue. Uh, and then on the Democratic side of the aisle, where in theory you have enough votes to do something like this, the reality is that you don't have 50 senators regard themselves as populists or who subscribe uh, to that set of priorities. You have uh, a group of senators who do. Uh, you have senators who are 
uh, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, ideologically concerned about the implications of this kind of taxation and or beholden to people who don't want to see these changes made. Uh, and it just, I mean, it takes one and, and you've more than one. So, uh, you know, there's, there's just not enough support for it. Mm -hmm. um, and Daniel, uh, if, if you were um, tax czar of the world or of the United States rather, um, would uh, this kind of billionaire unrealized gains proposal be your first choice or um, are there other things that you think would be uh, more effective at taxing the wealthy um, and fixing the system? I think if I were tax R and had control of the Supreme Court, I would do something like what Senator Wyden uh, proposed uh, and impose tax on gains at the end of each year. Uh, and I think Vinya is right that that is the, the non-taxation of unrealized gains is the main loophole that uh, high net worth people don't even need to think about in order to exploit. It's easy, it's just there in the code. Uh, there are two concerns given the current Supreme Court. Uh, one is that they'd say, this isn't really a tax on income. Uh, and if it's not a tax on income, then it's not explicitly authorized by the 16th Amendment. Uh, and uh, it would potentially be a direct tax that then needs to be apportioned among the states based on population, which would be a total disaster because uh, Connecticut has way more than 1% of the high-end wealth, but if it only has 1% of the population, we could only raise 1% of the revenue from Connecticut there'd really be no reason, no way to do this consistent with an apportionment requirement. The second concern is that the Supreme Court would say, well, it's a tax on income, but it's also a tax on wealth because it's triggered by having a net worth over in the Biden proposal over a hundred million dollars. Uh, in the Wyden proposal, I believe it was over a billion dollars. Uh, and a tax on wealth might also be a direct tax that then needs to be apportioned among the states. But I think even given our current Supreme Court, if we got rid of the stepped up basis loophole at death and we imposed a deferral charge on long held assets so that you didn't get a benefit from avoiding realization year to year, we'd be pretty close to our ideal system. Not all the way there, but close. Um, you just uh, laid on some complicated concepts and I was uh, just about to ask that. So Paul, can you... Uh, fill this in what uh, what Daniel just talked about the uh, what is the stepped up basis and why is that important and and what have we found right um, yeah so the stepped up basis is uh, it's a funny thing it's a very jargony phrase but then when you try to find another way to say the phrase there's really no better way that I can come up with say it and concisely which is why we say stepped up basis but the idea is you know normally during your life if you um, if you buy low and sell high you pay the difference, like the gain, and you pay tax on that. Um, but the, the question is, what is the, uh, in tax Jordan, about the basis? Like, what did you buy it at? And if once someone dies, the basis is goes to whatever the, the value is at that, at that time. So uh, if you bought it at a dollar and now it's trading at a hundred dollars and you die, your descendants, your heirs, Get to treat it as if it, it you bought it at, they bought it at hundred dollars, and so that gain is never taxed, and it's a massive benefit, particularly for people who own like you know large you know portions of stock, and essentially makes it so that if you can just push out a far enough horizon, this is this is part of buy borrow die right. The reason buy borrow die works, say borrow borrow die, borrow die. <laughs> um, it, the, way, the reason it works is because you can you push it off and then the tax is never paid because because of this provision in the tax code you can borrow against it you know if, if your wealth is going up that can pay for whatever you're borrowing uh, your, your loan um, and so there's tomorrow never comes essentially and we really found uh, billionaires really do borrow right i mean we found uh ellison we found musk yeah, they, they, they disclose it in the SEC filings and say, and sometimes the, the credit line, it's like owning, you know, like it's a home mortgage, like line of credit, except that the line of credit is worth like $100 billion. And I think you can live on that. And uh, Larry <laughs> Ellison managed to uh, buy a Hawaiian island. So I think that's um, pretty, pretty good. Uh, so Daniel, you talked about some of the objections and um, 
and Binya, I want to kind of uh, bring you in on some of the other objections to a billionaire income tax. Um, Daniel talked about uh, the problems at the Supreme Court. I kind of want to revisit that because there are aspects of the code that already um, account for unrealized gains. Uh, but but there are other objections to a billionaire income tax um, that you've surely heard. Uh, and one of them is that uh, assets uh, are very hard to value. Um, and uh, another that Daniel alluded to is that, uh, what are we gonna do, write uh, billion dollar checks to Mark Zuckerberg when stocks go down? Um, and, then I, I, and then a third is that they were kind of singling people out. And I want to pick up on that one first before we get into the valuation issues. And e what about singling the wealthy out? Why is it important to tax the wealthy? And are, uh, is Biden um, being mean to billionaires? Um, and who will, who will speak up for the billionaires, if so? You know, I think there's a there's a couple of ways to answer that question. The first, uh, you know, is the answer that Willie Sutton gave when they asked him why he robbed banks. He said that's where the money is. Uh, <laughs> if you're, you know, running a tax collection agency, you got to go to the people who've got the money. So that's number one. Number two is billionaires are the people who have benefited most from living in America, and it makes sense to ask them to pay their share toward the uh, operations and maintenance of this country. So yeah, they're being picked on. They're being picked on because they are the people who have uh, the most and who have benefited the most. And, and the idea is that you can ask them to contribute the most as well. And that's a reasonable thing to do. And that I think to most Americans, it seems intuitively unfair that uh, Warren Buffett's secretary should pay a higher share of her income to the federal government every year than does her boss. Uh, that's not a situation that comports with our sense of fairness or justice or equality. So that's sort of the underlying case uh, for doing this. Uh, you know, the objections that get raised to it, though, are not without some merit. Uh, the technical ones, you know, they all have solutions, but those solutions are imperfect. And one needs to accept that, that a system that, you know, has to value assets that aren't liquid is going to, uh, you know, arrive at some conclusions that are, you know, at least, you know, not purely defensible and that, uh, you know, there's going to be some problems uh, with, you know, year to year fluctuations in the value of assets. But to me, almost the most interesting one is, is how we ended up with stepped up basis in the first place, which is that we have this very ambivalent relationship politically with inherited wealth. Uh, you know, the idea that the government might put someone in a position where they might have to liquidate their family business, their family farm, the legacy of their parents is something that to uh, a lot of Americans, including a fair number who are not themselves in that position, uh, seems unfair and, and to be avoided. And so the tax code has in various ways been constructed to prevent that eventuality, to lean over so far in the direction of preventing that eventuality that we've, effect, you know, we've, we've sort of uh, taken any substance out of the estate tax system. Um, but that, you know, the morality of that or the desirability of that is sort of a, a central uh, preoccupation of a lot of people who get upset about this kind of taxation. Yeah, it's been an extraordinary political campaign over the last uh, several decades to uh, virtually eliminate the estate tax. Um, and as um, my colleagues, uh, Justin Elliott and James Bandler and uh, Trish Callahan found, um, they have, uh, the lobbyists against the estate tax have not only branded it the death tax, but also trotted out African-American farmers um, on a uh, kind of regular basis to, uh, um, to display them as the potential victims of uh, a, you know, estate tax or a stepped up basis elimination. But it should be said, that's not all AstroTurf, right? Like you've got a bunch of members of the Congressional Black Caucus who are themselves first generation African-American millionaires or whose you know, constituents and primary donors are first generation African-American millionaires. Uh, and, and they are some of the most vocal uh, opponents of this. They are, they are some of the most outspokenly you know, sort of forthright in saying basically like, this is ours, we don't want it taken away. There's a real political valence to that issue in, in uh, a particular portion of the African-American community. It's quite, quite interesting. Um, so uh, Daniel, what about uh, asset valuation? Is this as hard a, uh, a problem to solve as, um, as the opponents suggest? For some billionaires, no, it's not a problem at all. 
uh, with Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, we can figure out their net worth within a one or two percent margin of error really quickly by looking at SEC filings and uh, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ prices. It's a little bit harder for uh, the Mike Bloomberg's of the world uh, whose assets are in privately traded uh, uh, partnerships, but I think it's not an insuperable obstacle, uh, particularly if uh, you wait until death to value and then impose uh, something like a deferral charge to take back the essentially the benefit of the time value of money, uh, then it's just a one-time valuation. Uh, and we already have to do that for estate tax purposes. We can do that for income tax purposes too. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously the agency that would have to do this is one that you're intimately familiar with, Paul, um, uh, the IRS. Um, is the IRS, can you tell, uh, tell people what we found about the IRS in our previous reporting and, and then kind of weigh in on how much confidence you have that the IRS could uh, implement this kind of tax? Sure. So yeah, we started, uh, I believe in 2018, basically on the premise that the IRS had lost tens of thousands of employees and we figured, well, that can't be good. Uh, but we wanted to see what the effects of that and what what had caused that and, and tell the story of that. And essentially what it caused it is, a, you know, a 10 year campaign by Republicans to to cut funding and but not always on the basis that we want to make it impossible for the IRS to enforce the law. It was it was often like other stuff. So there was this scandal around politicization um, and how they were auditing a nonprofit, uh, well, a political groups. Um, but it was never like we want to make sure they can't, you know, audit uh, rich people. That's not what was said, at least out loud. Um, and so you, it leads to tens of thousands of, uh, you know, revenue agents and, and other enforcement uh, people leaving the agency, just retiring, essentially never being replaced. Um, and so we we talked to uh, scores of of these uh, people who have retired, and often like you know, them saying like, I was just like waiting for like the new blood to come in through the door so I could teach them what I learned over my decades and like, and never came, right? Um, and the effect of this has been, uh, you know, the IRS still has computers, even though they are running like, you know, 50 year old code sometimes. Um, and I think one thing people don't really realize is that, you know, lower, lower to mid income people generally, if they are audited or, or looked at by the IRS, they're audited more or less by a computer. You know, you have your W-2s and your other tax forms. Um, if you put in the wrong number, your computer's going to catch it and it's either just going to correct it for you and send you a message um, or it's going to result in an audit. And the audits often are just what's called correspondence audits, which is essentially just like a letter spit out by a computer that says, um, you know, you said your income was X, prove it. Like that's the audit. And then you have to send back documentation. And that's when a person will actually look at it. Um, so what we found is, you know, audits of low-income people had fallen much less precipitously than audits of the rich because to audit a wealthy person, to audit a business, it takes a skilled uh, practitioner, uh, you know, a revenue agent to ask the right questions, to go through the books and things get super complicated, particularly for like larger businesses or closely held businesses. Um, so those audits simply don't happen. And so, you know, the, the, the rates that have fallen since uh, 2011, it's like probably like 90% ish drop off in audits of, of the upper income uh, you know, typically like owners of businesses and that sort of thing. So uh, that's where we are. And so people question whether the IRS would be able to enforce something like this. And the answer is they do not currently enforce the law uh, because they can't. Um, so no, but that doesn't mean <laughs> it's not possible if they, you know, were adequately funded by, and by adequately funded, like what they had, you know, relative, you know, 10 years ago or something like that. Even back then though, people were saying they, you know, agents told us that it's not like, uh, you know, they had conferences and they traveled like that was like the big travel thing it was, but, you know, uh, it's not much to ask, I think. So, Binya, uh, the, the other uh, idea and other idea that's been floated in Congress is to adequately fund the IRS um, that got some uh, had some conversation about it um, last year periodically arises, um, but seems to be going nowhere. As, uh, if, if the billionaire income tax is going nowhere, what about 
um, other reforms of income tax and funding the IRS? Is this, uh, is this a dead letter in D.C. right now, even though the Democrats are ostensibly uh, in the majority? So Did, uh, well, did Binya, um, so I think, uh, you know, oh, okay. Sorry. I, uh, I sorry, wasn't you hearing me? you. I, I have you now. Uh, I wasn't hearing you. Okay. Maybe it was me. All right. So, okay. you know, I think in the first place, you know, the potential for, uh, increased enforcement to make a big difference is huge. To my mind, one of the most astonishing statistics, uh, about this is, you know, the IRS says that it, thinks that, you know, more than half of income that isn't verified by some source. So, you know, when you report your income to the IRS, you probably also send them a W-2. They can very easily check to see that you're, uh, you know, reporting the right amount of income. Uh, less than half of unverified income, they think, actually gets properly reported and taxed. That's an astonishing figure. I mean, this is just, tax fraud is, is rife. You've got just businesses all over this country running around and not not, uh, you know, not actually uh, fully reporting the income they're earning or paying taxes on it. So increased enforcement would make a huge difference. Uh, and it would, to some extent, enable uh, increased uh, crackdown on some of the things that, that wealthy individuals are doing. And I think that that's potentially enormously consequential. Uh, but we should be clear, as we were saying earlier, the tax system is not structured to collect uh, a significant amount of money from people like Jeff Bezos. And you know, you can hire as many IRS agents as you want to. If you do not change the rules of the tax system, Jeff Bezos is still going to be paying a minimal share of his income in federal income taxes. Uh, uh, and, and so that, you know, that's just the reality of the limits of, of this approach. But uh, does it have a chance? So, you know, the, the Democrats did kick some extra funding in the direction of the IRS uh, in their, uh, you know, most recent uh, government uh, spending bill. Uh, the IRS is currently hiring more agents. Um, it's been holding job fairs. There was one in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, that the Wall Street Journal wrote up recently. Um, and, and so, you know, they're doing more than they were doing two, three years ago. Uh, and, and it's possible that the Democrats will be able to, again, incrementally increase funding if they get another government spending bill through uh, before they lose control of the House next year. Um, but, you know, that's not going to transform the IRS. It's, it's not going to give it what its advocates say that it needs. Uh, it would it would fall short of that, but it, it's movement in the right direction. Daniel, how serious is um, the IRS's uh, uh, disability right now? How how crippled is it um, in your view? And and how serious a problem is this for you, the the tax collection system overall? I, what I was looking for from Binya, who sort of alluded to it but didn't. Um, quite come out and say that, you know, what this in the way that I was hoping, which was that this is a, a threat to the legitimacy of our government and the legi legitimacy of our democracy. And I wonder if you concur and how serious a threat do you think this um, we're, we're in right now, we're facing right now? I think it's a huge threat. Uh, I think Compliance remains surprisingly high across the board, given uh, that the IRS is so horribly underfunded. We think that people pay somewhere like 85% or so uh, of the tax that they owe. Uh, and I think there are some estimates that are uh, even higher than that into the 90s. So in general, people remain uh, paying their taxes. Uh, and I think most high income people are not engaged in blatant tax evasion. Uh, but part of the threat comes from the fact that for ordinary individuals, our interactions with the IRS are really frustrating. And that uh, because the IRS is, doesn't have enough people to answer the phones. And I think that contributes to a widespread anti-tax sentiment that then makes it harder to enact proposals like a billionaire's tax. Uh, I think even with the IRS's current staff, they could implement the billionaire's tax as applied to Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and raise a ton of money. Uh, but we need to change the law in order to do that. And the IRS is, uh, the fact that the IRS is so hamstrung makes it harder to change the law. So Jesse, speaking Jesse, about- I, I, I oh, yeah, just set up. So I just, I just wanna go on the record in the threat to democracy camp. I, I do subscribe <laughs> to that view. Excellent, thank you. Fine. Yeah, I, I'm glad that uh, I could feed you that, uh, that softball there. But, um, uh, 
so uh, what I one of the things that I was uh, interested in, let, let's circle back on the constitutional question, because um, one of the things I've been struck with is um, when you really delve into the code, uh, it turns out that unrealized gains are taxed with some frequency, Daniel. Um, hedge fund managers are able to choose voluntarily to have their assets marked to market, to, um, to have the current value of their assets uh, count for taxes, even if they haven't sold something. If you um, are uh, the kind of person who opts to give up your American citizenship uh, for whatever reason, um, on that day is uh, a big tax day for you and uh, all of your assets are valued. Um, uh, right then and there, of course, as you said, the, the state is uh, valued uh, at death. Um, they add up things. So this concept seems to be well established in the law. Um, how, how could such a well established concept be unconstitutional? If I were on the Supreme Court, I would vote to say that both a tax on unrealized gains and a wealth tax are constitutional. Well, we'll uh, uh, try to work of, toward that. The fact that, the fact that a, a provision is in the code doesn't mean that the Supreme Court would say it's constitutional. It just hasn't, the expatriation tax hasn't been challenged on constitutional grounds in a case that generated precedent from the Supreme Court. Uh, mm -hmm. The court has long made a, disti a distinction between taxes and excises, and an excise is a levy on a particular transaction. Uh, so some things that we describe as taxes are constitutionally excises. The corporate income tax, the Supreme Court has said, is an excise on the use of the corporate form. Uh, so I think one could coherently say that the expatriation tax is an excise on giving up your citizenship, uh, that uh, the mark-to-market tax on commodities dealers is an excise tax on the privilege of using commodities and futures exchanges, and still say that a tax that depends upon the total value of uh, your state uh, and not at death uh, would be subject to the direct tax provisions in the constitution. The Supreme Court has said that a tax at death is an excise on the transfer of assets to your heirs, so it's okay. Uh, but if nothing's changed and you're just sitting there, we don't have solid precedent to point to to say that it's constitutional. I think we have good arguments. So did... Uh... Cordell Hull and et al. Uh, mess up by it not taking the words direct tax out of the, uh, the Constitution when they were writing the 16th uh, Amendment? Yeah, the drafters of the 16th Amendment made a mistake, uh, and they should have just gotten rid of the direct tax clauses entirely. And there was a little bit of discussion on the Senate floor uh, at the time. Unfortunately, Norris Brown from Nebraska, who was one of the drafters of the 16th Amendment, explicitly said during the debates uh, that he didn't want to get rid of the pre-existing direct, ta direct tax provisions in the Constitution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Binya, you were talking, you raised a really interesting point about um, uh, African-American African legislature legislators. I was thinking that there was another kind of um, aspect of uh, progressive left discourse that has somewhat undermined the uh, push for higher taxes. Uh, the kind of um, monetary, uh, modern monetary theory, uh, MMT curious and uh, um, folks among the left. Uh, and in short, this is a theory that uh, essentially, and I'm going to drastically oversimplify, but that we can, um, we don't have to worry about deficits uh, and we can spend what we want to provide the government services we desire. Um, and in, in fact, uh, it will, I'm curious your view whether that has actually kind of undermined the case or undermined the push for taxing the wealthy that uh, people have said, you know, what, why should we spend political capital here when we can just uh, spend the money we want on the programs uh, we desire? Yeah, I mean, I, I, politically, I think that MMT really functions as a permission structure for liberal Democrats. It plays much the same role that supply side economics played for Republicans in the 1970s. It allows them to get around a political debate that they're not winning and to pursue their further goals without having to engage in that original fight. In the 70s, it was a fight around 
uh, deficits and whether or not they were dangerous. Uh, and now it's a fight around you know, taxes and whether or not they're necessary. And I do think that there are liberal Democrats for whom MMT offers a theory of why you might be able to pursue your agenda uh, without actually needing to go ahead and extract that money from the pockets of the wealthy. I don't think it's been the proximate cause of the failure of this legislation. The reality is that, you know, uh, those liberal Democrats, for the most part, would still vote for a wealth tax, even if they're not as fervent in their support for it. Uh, you know, the, the reason this isn't moving forward is because of the other end of the political spectrum, or at least the other end of the Democratic Party. Uh, but I do think that it has shifted thinking about the priorities uh, and has allowed, at least for some liberal Democrats, a greater emphasis on new forms of social spending uh, as, as being able to move ahead without necessarily resolving the inequities of the tax code. And are there any cracks on the right? Uh, you know, you've seen these um, populist Republicans flirting with antitrust, for instance, you know, one of the provinces of the left uh, in recent years. Um, and, um, you know, so uh, are there, is there any sign that there are any Republicans who kind of break with this uh, sort of 40 year uh, lower tax Grover Norquist uh, orthodoxy? I think this is a fascinating question uh, because, you know, you have exactly as you just said, you have, you know, this, this Grover Norquist sort of uniform policy to which all Republicans are, are required to subscribe that any tax increase is anathema. And, and that is holding in place. But underneath it, you can see signs of intellectual inconsistency, uh, grappling with these questions about, you know, OK, if we've got wealthy people in this country who have amassed power to the point that it's making us uncomfortable, and there are definitely Republicans who feel that way in particular about the tech billionaires, what do we do about that? Uh, do we break apart their companies? Is that consistent with capitalism? Do we think about ways of uh, you know, attacking their wealth directly? Uh, is that consistent with our views on taxation? So I think you know, it, it has not risen to the level yet where you have Republicans standing up and saying we're in favor of this, but I think that there are interesting intellectual debates happening in some parts of the Republican Party uh, about how you grapple with a political reality there are concerns about inequality on both ends of the political spectrum. Uh, and, and the question of whether changes to the tax code become one vehicle through which Republicans are willing to pursue that, I think is really interesting. The form in which I think it is most likely to arrive, at least initially, uh, would be in terms of, of closing loopholes or restructuring things in a revenue neutral way. That's the most uh, sort of uh, theologically palatable way to move forward. And speaking of closing loopholes, Paul, so if we were, uh, you know, uh, if, if the country couldn't get a billionaire's income tax passed, which it doesn't look like it can, um, what, are the, what have you uh, thought of as the, the most obvious or, you know, easiest to implement or not necessarily easiest to implement, but um, uh, the, the change in the code that demanded the most attention. I mean, when you talk about Stephen Ross reporting to the IRS that he's losing 400 and odd million dollars a year, even as his assets are going up and his uh, properties are making money, if he's got these loss making vehicles, um, you know, I think the average person would say that's just not right. How, how would you fix that? Is that easy? Is it difficult? Is it, um, what are the most obvious fixes in your view? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's fixes that I think of that are part of uh, the legislation in the last year. So like the Peter Thiel Roth IRA situation, there, there was legislation that developed on Capitol Hill after that story that we understood from experts would actually fix that problem and somewhat return Roth IRA to a structure that, you know, is actually going to the people it's supposed to go to. Um, and what would, do you remember what that fix would do? It, it would it would essentially like make them uh, divest of from the if I'm saying this correctly, um, you know, kind of roll back the the these giant like the, this tax protected account and and make it so that you know it wasn't they would never pay gains uh, taxes on the gains from those accounts. Um, and I so, think you could couldn't put exotic instruments into a Roth IRA. You'd have to put sort of publicly traded uh instruments you know because he was putting his uh, founder stock in there and uh, there would be some limits on that i think right too. um and, and so like you know the estate tax thing um there are fixes that that were talked about on capitol hill that are in biden's budget that i understand from experts and you know daniel can 
um, comment on this that that would fix this issue of, of creating trust that get around the estate tax so easily. Um, and this issue of like Stephen Ross or, or billionaires having like negative income, you know, tax, uh, uh, sorry, negative incomes for purpose of their tax returns to the point that, you know, we were able to document that like stimulus checks were sent out to like a bunch of billionaires and super rich people who had negative AGIs, um, sorry, negative uh, incomes on, on their tax returns. That is something that actually was in the Trump tax bill to, to curb that. Um, and there was something that, like, you know, Democrats have basically talked about expanding that and basically it would, have, it would make it so that um, you, you can't just wipe out all your income 10 times over, there would be a limit to that. So these are fixable problems um, if, if there was a will to, to pass legislation to fix them. Um, so I think we'll uh, start to um, take some audience questions now. And uh, a lot of questions are in interesting because they're uh, our listeners and, and viewers, I guess, are focused on um, a lot of the technicality. So it, here's one, I think, Daniel, maybe you would uh, take this um, from Zachary Camel. Um, can you discuss ways in which the wealthy uh, could manipulate losses to reduce owing in a given year if they were um, being taxed on their unrealized gains? I, you know, how a real estate guru might default on several multi-million dollar mortgages, uh, but also purchase a multi-million dollar property in the same year. So could they, are there ways to manipulate uh, wealth growth? There are, uh, though I don't think they're any greater than the manipulation opportunities that exist under the current code. Uh, and uh, fair market value plays a disciplining role. Uh, the way for Elon Musk to manipulate his uh, tax under a mark to market system would be to manipulate the value of Tesla stock. Uh, and he'd have to diminish the value of Tesla stock, which I don't think he'd want to do because he'd only be saving 20 cents on the dollar uh, and he'd be losing the other, uh, the other 80 cents. Maybe he'd try. Um, but uh, the, I think, biggest way to avoid a mark to market tax would be to take currently public companies private uh, so that we can't see the change in value year to year. That's possible for some smaller enterprises. It's just not possible for Tesla and for Amazon. There's just not enough private equity capital uh, mm -hmm. to take those uh, private. And even for the people who do go private, uh, ultimately, they're either going to die or sell their assets. Uh, and we could, uh, at that moment, do a serious valuation uh, that takes back some of the benefits that they might have gotten from uh, understating the value earlier on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, Paul, uh, a lot of people wrote in to say, ask whether the middle class can use the tactics that we wrote about that billionaires use. <coughs> what do you, can they? What did we find? No, it's funny because, I mean, when we were doing our story about all these benefits in the tax code for people who own real estate and, you know, oil and gas and that kind of stuff, a lot of those goes back a long way. But there was like a real boom in, I don't say like middle income, but upper middle income people using, uh, you know, uh, generating losses, uh, tax losses. So, you know, uh, and to the point where it was a big deal in the 1970s and 80s, and it was something that was addressed in legislation in the 1980s, and they, they closed a lot of the ways that people were generating losses and getting rid of their wages. Um, but it really struck us the way that those reforms were really good at making sure that like, you know, your, your dentist or your lawyer or somebody like that could um, you know, closing their their, uh, their 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 way of getting out of taxes. But if you own a business, a lot of that those same opportunities are are it's much more easy to generate losses on real estate that you own if you're a real estate developer and that sort of thing. Um, so it really that that was pretty striking to us the way they closed the door to to average you know people but up their income scale. These sort of things are still possible. Um, and Binya, uh, we've got a another question, and I don't know if this is going to put you on the spot, but um, do the Scandinavian countries tax billionaires fairly? And if, if not, um, if, if you don't know the specifics there, in general, across the world, is there anybody who's doing this well? As, uh, I'm not familiar with an unrealized gains uh, tax system anywhere else in the world, for instance. 
So I'm not either, and, and Daniel may be better positioned to answer that question. I don't know. I think Scandinavia has huge problems in taxation of the rich. Uh, some problems that we've actually solved uh, that uh, Sweden has a whole lot of hundred millionaires who are putting money into offshore accounts. And we're actually, I think, pretty good at catching the American hundred millionaires and billionaires who are doing that. We, we were struck, Daniel, um, Paul and I and uh, the team were struck when you see these giant leaks, uh, the Pandora Papers, Panama Papers, you see relatively few Americans um, and very few named Americans. And, and the conclusion we drew from that is uh, one that we've essentially been talking about this whole time, that it's so easy legally to avoid taxes in the United States. Why bother breaking the law or uh, engaging, engaging in um, you know, complex secrecy when you uh, don't have to? Do you, do you agree with that? Is that why we haven't been seeing uh, Americans in these leaks? Yeah, I think that the US is doing pretty well compared to other OECD countries in terms of preventing our high net worth taxpayers uh, from using these offshore vehicles. Not perfect. Uh, there's certainly some of it happening. Uh, part of it is because our code is so porous. Uh, part of it is also because uh, we basically told the rest of the world, you've got to give us information on the Americans who have tax accounts uh, in your countries. But there's no reciprocity. We're not telling them about the foreigners who have their money in the United States. Uh, and Binia, this is a question we've gotten in several forms, uh, which is, you know, billionaires give a lot to philanthropy. Um, and uh, what's the problem with that? Um, uh, for instance, occasionally they even give it to uh, ProPublica, which we are, we are grateful um, for. So we want to carve out if we eliminate those, those benefits. But um, so uh, is there a problem with uh, billionaire philanthropy? And um, uh, is it better to tax them than to uh, have philanthropy? And should we get rid of uh, the uh, charitable deduction or limited in some fashion? So, right. So the question is compared to what, right? Like if a bill, if you're asking, should the billionaire spend it on another swimming pool or should they give it to the local food bank? It's obviously got some social benefits if they give it to the local food bank. If they instead turn that money over to the government, would it do more good? I think there's a very good case that it would. Uh, you know, public uh, resources can be put to use in ways that private individuals uh, cannot. Philanthropy has a hugely important role to play in society. The extent to which uh, the tax code incentivizes it is frankly unclear. Uh, you know, the extent to which it would continue if you eliminated the charitable deduction tomorrow, uh, I think is, is entirely unclear. Many of these efforts are motivated by considerations other than or in addition to the tax benefits. Uh, and, and so, you know, whatever you think about philanthropy, I think is quite a different question than what you think the tax code should do to encourage it. Uh, but at a very basic level, I do personally believe that uh, we would be better off as a society if instead of uh, allowing Bill Gates to allocate his fortune, a larger share of that fortune was transferred to the federal government and the people of the United States could decide how to allocate it, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Buffett uh, said in a response to uh, our first story, uh, I think I can allocate it better than the US government. Um, turns out that I have better ideas than even Warren Buffett on how to allocate tax dollars, but, uh, uh, but maybe other people wouldn't agree with my ideas and, and we allocate them in a democratic fashion or seek to. Um, here's an interesting question, Daniel, from Paul Beckett. Um, from Oxford Brooks University. Uh, and um, I think you've, so we've sort of talked a little bit about this, but what he says is to the, what extent are the beneficial ownership avoidance products of the domestic US tax havens, such as South Dakota, um, complicit in the tax avoidance planning of the ultra wealthy in the US? And I think we've talked a little bit about how Americans um, uh, might not be using this as much as uh, foreign kleptocrats, um, although certainly Americans use trusts um, in enormous ways. So I wonder, one, how much do Americans use our tax avoidance? Actually, let's back up. Uh, can you summarize that we are really the biggest tax haven in, in the world, aren't we? Um, and does that pose a problem? How much are Americans using this? Um, uh, and, and does this undermine our credibility around the world when we talk about uh, tax enforcement? Yeah, I think Americans are using South Dakota trusts, but not for the same 
tax evasion reasons that foreigners might be using South Dakota trusts. Um, and I think we are the world's ultimate tax haven. Uh, the Cayman Islands, uh, uh, Antigua, those countries are replaceable in the tax evasion game. Uh, what you really need is ultimately a country that will take your money and invest it in real things and not look too hard. Uh, and the United States does that. We allow foreigners to pour money into the New York Stock Exchange and other US exchanges, and we allow them to earn gains and we don't tax them on their gains. Uh, and that is the engine of international tax evasion. Uh, we also compete with the Cayman Islands and Singapore and other sort of intermediary offshore tax centers by providing secrecy. Uh, and we do that primarily for non-Americans. Uh, I think Americans are putting money into South Dakota trusts in order to get out of a state tax. And once you get the money into a South Dakota trust, it can basically grow forever, uh, is state tax free. Uh, but that's not hiding it from the IRS. That's legal under our current laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so is there any effort to close those kind of loopholes that you're familiar with, Binya? I mean, these are, it's not just South Dakota, Wyoming, Alaska, uh, uh, Delaware, you know, there are a variety of states that have uh, become, you know, uh, Reno, Nevada, uh, become tax havens. Um, is there any ability uh, in our political system currently to even address that? So the place where you see people upset about it is in other countries. I mean, it is certainly the case that tax authorities in other countries are aware that some of their wealthy citizens are using the United States as a tax haven. And it is an issue that comes up regularly in discussions uh, of you know, uh, the possibility of, of changes in international law or in uh, the, the, you know, when the United States is asking for uh, countries to be more transparent in the way that they handle uh, these records, uh, you know, foreign countries sometimes return that to us and say, basically, we want the, the same thing from you. Do I think it's going to change? I don't see any evidence that it will. Uh, the United States has tremendous leverage in these negotiations and has, for the most part, been unsympathetic to foreign concerns about these issues, in part because the American perspective is basically we are accepting investments in legitimate things and, you know, it's not our job to police uh, where that money's coming from, you know, we're selling an apartment, we're selling shares of stock, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're selling trusts in South Dakota. Um, I, I, the short answer is I don't see a lot of evidence that the United States is interested in, in cracking down on any of that. All right, so we're, we're winding up. Um, I really appreciate the time, but let me just pose one quick question for um, you, Binya and Daniel, uh, to, to close uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, it was, we had the first income tax in the Civil War, and it took uh, roughly 50 years for the 16th Amendment to be passed. Um, the uh, income tax, there was an income tax in 1894 that was passed and struck down by the Supreme Court. And so it took another 15 years or so um, before that income tax uh, was uh, passed Supreme Court muster. So um, we've had a kind of groundbreaking proposal from the Biden administration about taxing the wealthy. Do we, is this the beginning of the, a kind of cycle that would get us to uh, some big political change in the next uh, decade or two decades? Or is this gonna just dissipate um, because of uh, the calcification of our political system? Binya and then Daniel, and then we'll say uh, au revoir. I think it's the right question. I think we don't know that yet. I think it is true that you know rising levels of inequality uh, are provoking a political reaction as they did 150 years ago. Uh, and I think the optimistic scenario is that over time, uh, you know, the the uh, the antipathy to this uh, level of inequality and these accumulations of wealth coalesces into politically viable and popular forms that can move through uh, the House and Senate and uh, pass onto the president's pen. Uh, whether that's going to happen, I think, is a very open question for the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, our political system is broken in some pretty fundamental ways, and it's easy to get discouraged about the prospects for change. But uh, better to end on a hopeful note and say, uh, maybe we will move in that direction. I, I certainly hope so. You endorse that, Daniel? I agree. I think the failure of the Biden billionaires' taxes are its highly contingent. If it hadn't been for the Delta and Omicron variants, uh, this might have happened because we'd have a slightly more popular president who would have been able to 
push it through with his political capital. Um, and uh, one optimistic uh, note is that for tax changes, it only takes 50 votes in the Senate rather than 60 votes. So could the Democrats have uh, a majority that doesn't depend upon Manchin and Cinema in the next six or eight years? I think definitely possible. Interesting. Uh, well, thank you guys so much. Um, and Connor, over to you. I really appreciate that. And Paul, yeah. thank you. Thank you guys so much. That's our time for today. Uh, I just want to thank all of our speakers, Paul, Daniel, Binya, and Jesse, for an informative and timely conversation. And thank you to our audience for joining us and for all your thoughtful questions.